<laughs> we can uh, might as well get started. Uh, we'll take a few moments as usual. Make sure we're in fellowship. Make sure that we're we have the right frame of mind and, and state of uh, position. That is uh, in fellowship with the Lord. If we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. So we'll we'll take a few moments. Uh, so each one of you can do that privately to the Lord. Speak to Him. Ask Him that. Uh, to, to make sure that we're in fellowship with him and so that we can learn your word, his word, much better. Father, we come before you and ask that you might continue to work in our hearts and souls and minds. Uh, cleanse us from all sin, Father, that, so we can be in fellowship, so that you can be glorified by the things we say and we do. So a moment of silence so each of you can do that privately. Father, we come before you, give you thanks for this time you've given us. We pray that your Holy Spirit may enlighten us, may clear to us your truth, so we may be used to be uh, to your glory, to your honor, in all that we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you got your quiz, uh, so you, we can go through each one of these uh, sections. Uh, I'm going to do quiz number two. And is it going to be on here? Yes. Oh, good. You'll see it up there. Uh, no, I can see it. <laughs> uh, so the first one, first question, <laughs> notice, so again, First John uh, chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, it says, if, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is, self is in, in, in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, so here, who is he talking? Uh, would you say he's talking to, uh, who's speaking in this case, in, this, in this, uh, this letter? Remember, this is a letter, so who's speaking? Paul. John. John. Oh, John. John. Yep. Oh, John is the one. John. Oh, that's first, first John. John. Yeah, that's first John. That's first John. That's no. first John. I was six and seven. I knew the verse, but I wouldn't. So who, who is he speaking to? In other words, if you if you looked at the letter, you really don't have anyone where he says to my so my son so. Timothy or mm -hmm. to what, he doesn't mention. So we have to say he talks about fathers to fathers to. Uh, to sons and to children. So he's talking to those within relationship with him. So other Christians is the best I can uh, we can say. And we can see here in 1 John 1.12 I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven you, you for his name's sake. And it says I'm writing to you fathers because you, you know him. So here he's talking to people that first of all, they're children. It means that they are relationship. Uh, and then uh, writing to your fathers. So he's talking about people that are uh, adult uh, believers. Who have, and notice, who, uh, lo know him. In other words, to know him, someone who's mature. It isn't, it isn't newborn babes, right? And he says, uh, <clears throat> and you know him uh, as been from the beginning. I am writing to you young men. So now it's intermediate. Right? Because you have overcome the evil one. And I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. So we, we can tell this is talking to believers. We don't have unbelievers in, in the crowd. Well, we might have some unbelievers. Oh, come on. Come on. No Hope uh, you have your Get back, uh, quiz two. Uh, that's what I'm going through right now, and it's basically going through First John uh, six through seven, and it's basically the second quiz has to do with uh, in interpretation. We were looking to interpret what those two passages are saying, and therefore that's this this review that I'm going through now instead of we did 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 you know, as the class, but now we're going to go through 1, uh, 1 John 1, 6 through 7 and repeat the same process, but you guys were supposed to do that on your own uh, and, and see how, you know, I, I might have made it easy because I did it for you in front of you. But now, you know, once you try to do it on your own, then you say, well, okay, now I, I, I can tell it's a little bit more difficult. Notice, as I said here, we're in 1 John uh, 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 2, 12 to 14, because we're looking for context, and who is he speaking to? We already established that it was John the Apostle who's writing, and to who is he writing? Uh, I'm, I'm making a case no. here, based on no. context, that it's to other Christians. No. Uh, um, and here, uh, for example, in 12, it says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers. Now he's talking to mature believers, we said. Uh, he says, because you know him uh, who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men. So he's talking about intermediate people that are strong. And notice he makes a compliment to them. He says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Uh, I have written to you, children, again, now he reduces it back to children, because you know the Father. So these are all believers. None of these seem to be unbelievers. Some people have taken this passage or have taken First John to say this is a test to find out if you're a believer or not a believer. I think Paul, see, I mean, no. John is assuming he's just speaking to believers because that's what he's doing here. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I have written to you young men because you are strong. And the word of God, notice what this word, abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. How does someone overcome the evil one? Is abiding. I want you to notice that. that uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and we're going to see how that's related to this first uh, to the, our passage under under uh, review here for interpretation and there's other passages uh, 3 1 he says see how great a love the father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of a God and such we are for this reason uh, and then it goes on to say uh, and then verse chapter chapter 5 verse 13 he also brings that up again he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, there's a, uh, how do we know we're saved? How do we know we're in fellowship? Eternal life, I'm gonna, we're gonna, I brought this in earlier when I mentioned regarding eternal life. Most, many people say, well, that's talking about somebody who's saved. I'm saying you have to be saved in order to have eternal life. Uh, but that doesn't automatically happen in the sense of how we live. In other words, eternal life is not just a, uh, Paul, I mean, yeah, there's other passages where we talk about eternal life. It is a state of, of a condition that we are saved and forever saved. Here when John uses it, we're going to see some other conditions that he talks about. A murderer can't have eternal life abiding in him. And we're going to see that that, that has to do with believers have to be in fellowship in order to be have eternal life abiding but if you're out of fellowship the, the love of God is not abiding in you you're not in fellowship you're outside of fellowship and you're walking in darkness all of those terms have to do with that so we'll, we'll take a look as we I have other passages that will bring that up but here the other thing is uh, we see that there's a another uh, thing that's going on uh, when he's talking to par participants who, uh, and what happens. Notice there are people involved in here that may not be saved or they may be saved but yet still be causing problems. And that's what we have here in verse 18. 118. Yeah, I'm sorry. For, uh, 218. 218 says, Children, it is the last hour, just as you have heard. The Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. Okay, so now he's talking to the children. He's talking to believers and says, we have Antichrists out here that are, do that are causing issues, right? And, uh, and, and we see here uh, in verse 22, 
also bring up this same idea. Who is a liar? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. If you, re if you reject that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is come to save and all, then, and remember, Christ has to do uh, with the anointed one, the, the Messiah. Anybody that's rejecting that, he says, they're the Antichrist. Now, Antichrist, uh, we, we sometimes say we're talking about the, the ultimate Antichrist, somebody who, who goes against Christ. There's a, anti means against, or instead of, in the place of. So in this passage, we're going to have to see which one of those two relies on that passage. I believe it, it basically shows it's someone who's against Christ. That's what's bringing out, because they're saying Jesus is not the Christ. They're not coming in. He says, I am, I am the new Christ. No, they're just saying he isn't, he isn't Christ. He didn't come in the flesh. So you follow what I'm saying? There's a difference. So when we see read that word antichrist, we have to see what's it inferring. Is it talking about someone who's coming in in the place of Christ or uh, someone who's against Christ? Now, somebody that comes in uh, in the place of Christ is against Christ just automatically. But in the case, when we're talking about in this context, we're saying someone who's attacking the person and work of Jesus Christ. So that's the Antichrist in that sense, the spirit of Antichrist is here. So it's there. those are under attack. The Christians are under attack by these antichrists, these people that are coming in with false doctrines. And, and we'll see that in the rest of the book. So those are the ones that are participating. Paul, I'm mean, John the writer, Christians who are being uh, told uh, to beware. And then the, the attackers are these antichrist people. And uh, so now we go to how. Uh, remember, I, this is the who, what, when, where, how. We're looking at the whole book, and that's what I want you to notice. And uh, and then, what's this book talking about? Yeah. And that, how do we find that out? What do you think is the, finding out what the book is talking about? I always I try to get you to understand. It's basically using a word study to find out how many times the same word is repeated. That's a that's a good indication, right? If some word is repeated many times, and evidently that's what he's talking about. Right? And that's where we find, for example, love. Love is repeated 26 times in, in this small little epistle. Uh, five chapters, love is repeated so many times. So, And then we, we have to say, well, what, what love is it talking about? I mean, how many of you guys uh, I know about love? <laughs> you know, we, we talk, you go on TV, you'll watch plenty of people talk about love. But it's talking about personal love, right? Uh, it's based on attraction uh, and love. Sometimes just sexual. That's it. But it, you know, and again, those are uh, what we, what many people would attach to this word love. But if you go into context, you'll find that here, love is not just a a word about attraction. It's an attitude. It's a position. We're going to see that. Let's take a look real quick. Uh, uh, oops, I knew I, I knew I forgot to do that. Let's go to chapter two. Uh, two. And two, uh, five. This is uh, where we're going <clears> to <throat> see that this word right before our context, right? It says, but whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. I want you to understand, this the idea of being in him has to do with fellowship. Okay? This love complex, I, mean, that, I guess that's the best way I can explain it, because one, it's love for God, that we truly, it's perfected means that it's complete. There's not, not lacking. Uh, and when we talk about in, uh, in, in Corinthians chapter 13, where it says uh, love is, love is long-suffering, love does not keep a long list of wrong. Love, it's a description of an attitude 
And none of that, if you notice, has anything about, what about the object and the attraction of the object? Nothing. It talks about an inward attitude of the person in him. And then that's what this is. It's basically the sum, when love is completed in an individual, the kind of love that he demands, and the kind of love that God demonstrated. Uh, we're going to see that, uh, uh, for example, God so loved the world. That's in John, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, did the, was the world attractive to him? Did he look down and says, oh, man, I like the way they comb his hair. I like the way George combs his hair or, you know, beard or whatever. Nothing. <laughs> it's basically an attitude that God does the best even for his enemies. Right? So that's the kind of love that this John is really speaking of. That's why he's called the apostle of love. He, he explains it, and that's where we have to go through every one of these verses to kind of get a better idea. And we see here uh, 2, <coughs> two five. it's talking about that. Notice, I want you to notice this, but whoever keeps his word, in other words, it requires us obedience. God doesn't say, well, you love me, that's great, uh, you know, that's a good thing that you do. No. He says, you show me by obeying me. Jesus says, the Father loves me because of the way I obey him. I do everything to the Father. This is how you remain in this love. So, in fellowship, in the light, have all to do, and we see that right here in the next verse, right? Verse 6, it says, the one who abides in him, notice it says, Says this is how we know that we are in him, that we're abiding in him. Notice he said, <clears throat> abides in him, ought to himself walk in the same manner as he walked. So all of this has to do with a not an emotion, it has to do with a position. Um, and we'll make better case 10 15. Uh, uh, we see verse 10, right? Okay. The one who loves his brother abides in the light. You're in fellowship if you love your brother. Right? And there is no cause for stumbling in him. In other words, while you're in fellowship, you, are, you have that love for your, your brother. But notice the opposite. And I want you to see that there's Paul, John seems to make this dichotomy. You either here or you're here. Now this gray area, you know, you're either in the light or you're in darkness. And notice he says, if you if you love your brother, then yeah, you're walking in yeah in 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 in, in the light here. And he says, uh, but the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So. If for some reason a person who's a believer thinks that they're in fellowship with God but hates his brother, as this whatever whoever they are, doesn't matter. Notice then then you are definitely outside of fellowship. We're not to hate anyone. Period. We're that's that's the idea. You're either in fellowship or you're not. You're in darkness or you're in light. And uh, we see here uh, in verse uh, 15, it says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now notice, loving of the world has to do with attraction outside. Outside of fellowship with the Lord. And, and how, how do I know that? Because it goes on to say, what attracts people? Notice what he says in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So all of these, notice these are more emotional. These are more, speaking of an emotional kind of love. People love money. People love attract, all these other things outside in the world. He says, not. The love of the Father is not there. That's not the love of the Father. Now, God said, you know, and John says, God so loved the world. So was he talking about the attraction of the world? No, he was saying his attitude of how he does the best, even for his enemies. Here is talking about we're not to love the world in that way. This other way, 
the way of saying, <laughs> uh, I'm attracted by what I see, but what I feel, the lust of the flesh, right? So, or the boastful, you know, I want to be proud. I want to have, this is me, kind of a thing. So all those, that's the opposite. That's not the love of God, okay? The love of God, he talks about more, more uh, with more details later in chapter 3, right? Uh, chapter 3, verse uh, uh, 10, now, 10 to 23, there's a whole big section. I'm not, I'm, we're not going to read all of that, but I want you to understand. It's a big thing in the eyes of John, what, we, what he means by love. So we should have a good definition of what, what kind of love we're supposed to have, or how do we demonstrate we have love for God. And that's what he says. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not, from, not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So if we practice, now notice there's another word that's going to be used several times. Um, the idea of uh, what we do on a regular basis, you know, kind of a thing. <clears throat> and here it says, uh, but, but he says, uh, if, but, you know, if, but this is the chill. This is how we can tell the difference. People that hate the brothers, or, or, or in this case, the other thing, he says, uh, practice unrighteousness. Those two things make it obvious. That's what he said. Those are the ones that really don't love God. They're, the love of God is not abiding in them. They're not in fellowship. That that's what this is saying. It isn't saying this is a test to whether or not you're saved or unsaved. Okay. I want you to see that here in this passage, just making a, an obvious, an obvious uh, observation. If you see someone who loves God, loves pe people, doesn't hate them, th then you can see this is a type of person that the love of God is in him. Okay, that's all it's doing. It's not saying this person is unsaved and this person is saved. This is just saying here's somebody who's in fellowship, who's walking in the light, doing what's right, and here's ones that are not. That's all. And then he says those are ones that are following uh, the, 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 the Satan and his work, his the works of Satan. Okay, and that's what verse eight says: the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God, notice what it says. This uh, people say, well, it's born. That means born again. In this case, it's someone who is in fellowship. It's not, you know, right away we see born, that means born again. And I, I'm going to tell you this because we can see in the context, it would, it would say that, uh, 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 for example, right here, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. Now, what's going on? The abiding part. The abiding means staying in fellowship with God. He says, if, if that's going on, he says, you won't. And he cannot sin. Now, in 1 first, in first John 1, 8, it says, he who says he has no sin is a liar. Right? So this can't be meaning sinless perfection. This has to do with either when I'm in abiding in God, when I'm walking in the light, there's no sin in me. I'm not sinning. Okay? And he says, because he's born of God. By this, the children, uh, and then it says, are obvious, the children of, uh, uh, of God and the children of light. Okay, so uh, uh, that's, uh, let's see what else can I, uh, I can't go through every one of these. So let's go through uh, verse f chapter 4. There's another one, it's okay, 4 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for the love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For the love, for the for God is love. So now it says, if you know the essence of God, who and what he is, you can't be a person that hates his brother. And and, and that's what it says. It isn't and I think here it says, by this the love of God was manifest in us. 
that God has sent his son, only begotten son, into the world so that we might live through him. There's a purpose of what Jesus Christ. We were saved not just to be saved. In other words, if God, that's we were done, he could have just taken us off the face of the earth. He says, okay, he's saved. Okay, let's get him out of the fire. He goes into heaven. He leaves us here with a purpose. And notice it says that he might live through him. In other words, God can, you can, people will reflect. You'll reflect Jesus Christ to other people. That, that's what he's talking about. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation. A propitiation means to satisfy the wrath of God. Uh, that's what he did. Uh, <clears throat> we have come to know, now this here's, here's, a, here's a measure where, you know, we, we could say, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm saved and everything. But here's a measure, it's going to tell us of here. Here's this, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. Uh, and the one who has abides, notice this word again, abides in love, abides in God, and God abides in him. Notice there is a meshing together that when when someone who's in fellowship with God and we're we're we're, we're and we're growing. We have we've come to know. You know, who was remember there was three people three classes of people we had the fathers the young men and the children but notice the young men he says you have known you, the fathers know and then the the, uh, the young men are the word of God is abiding them and they they know so the the young ones are the ones that need more help uh, and that's where Paul I mean John is going to give them a little bit more advice he says, by this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Notice, what judgment? Of being saved or unsaved? No, it's talking about rewards and no rewards. Okay? He says, because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love. In other words, you don't, you don't have to worry. You're not a person that, that, is, that has confidence in the Lord and in demonstrating, walking in fellowship, can have this confidence in this world, not, not fearing even death. They laugh at death. Why? Because death is not the end. We, we know where we're going. So people that ain't saved, I, I can understand why they're fearing. Uh, but people that are saved and growing in the Word, yeah, they're, they're going to have a confidence, and that's what he's talking to these people here. And that's why he says, there is no fear in love, but the but perfected love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. If you're, if you're afraid of what you're doing is wrong, then you have a cause for fear. But if you know what you're doing is right and you're, you're doing, you're obeying, being obedient to the word, you, have, you don't have that fear of God's going to punish me for whatever. I mean, there may be difficulties in my life, right? You know, God doesn't promise you know we're going to walk through uh, roses and all that. But there's, but the idea that we're not, we know that when we're doing God's will, whatever suffering or, or pain that comes in, it's not not for punishment. That's what Paul John is talking about. It isn't something that I'm I'm worried about. Okay, so if you want to really read more about love, the you know. John is going to explain a lot more. I, I, you know, I just skimmed a few of these. And then we have uh, the next word. Like I said, love was used 26 times in this small little book. So therefore, uh, if I want to know more about love, go to that book and it, it should give us more detail. And especially over chapter 3, verses 10 to 23, that's the longest. And then chapter 4, verses 7 to 21 uses those uh, uh, love in there and it's a lot of explanation. Okay, so if you disagree with what I'm saying about what love is here, go through those verses and you can come to the same conclusion or should. Okay, now we go to truth. That's used eight times. Uh, and, uh, and, and truth is in this, uh, in this, in, past, in chapter one. We see that's in our verse, so we can read that for a minute says, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. Notice, practicing means that we're not 
abiding. We're not con con uh, utilizing the word of God because what's truth? Jesus Christ says uh, it's the word of God. So if we're not practicing it, then uh, uh, then we're lying. So truth is there. Uh, truth uh, later on, verse eight is also in there. We we already saw uh, six. That's part of the verse that we're trying to determine what it, everything is being said. But notice verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Again, another. If we say we don't we don't have any lie, no no sin to to, to confess. We don't have no sin to do. Then. According to this, we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. Uh, and then uh, another truth uh, passage, uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 4. Are we still on this page? Yeah, I'm, I'm going oh, through most of the... Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I missed, uh, I should have went to this one. This is the passage. <laughs> this is what all the words. I was I'm trying lost to get there. Yeah, well, that's okay. It says here, we're talking about what. So what is, uh, yeah. is where all of these, and you see all my my search of looking at what's, what this book is about. I said 26, it's love. <laughs> so if I would say what this epistle is about, it's about love. Okay. And then but truth. That, but that other page had the whole first John, so it covers everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Truth though. So here uh, we see, uh, uh, let's see, we're looking at Truth chapter 2, verse 4. Okay. Verse 4. Okay. The one who says, I have come to know him, it does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Again, it's like John is just make sure you guys get the idea. Truth is here. <coughs> if you're not obeying what the Word of God is, the, His commandments are all these. You know, we say, well, is it that the Ten Commandments? <coughs> no, no, it's talking about New Testament. There's a lot of commandments in the New Testament. A lot of things that are being said, like you know, do not be drunk with wine, but be ye filled by the with the Spirit. That's a command. Uh, another passage is. Uh, you know, uh, several other commands are, are in the scripture. So it's talking about whatever the imperative mood, whatever commands are in the scripture, those are the ones we're to obey for, uh, for uh, to live this Christian life <coughs> in the church age. So that means most of what Paul's epistles, that's where we can get truth for, of what we're to obey. <clears throat> but it says, it, it says, I have come to know him. You know? So there's a uh, an increase of knowledge. You know, a lot of people say, well, no, either it's faith or no, no knowledge. No, I'm saying faith is knowledge. I mean, we, we know and then we believe. In other words, none of this idea that says, I've got to separate science from, from, from faith. Even scientists have faith. They believe that evolution happened. They believe, you know, the Big Bang. But you know, that's still faith. Either they believe it or they don't, right? But we, we attach our belief system to the rest of the Word, the, the Word of God, right? Which is, uh, is the only place I can say there is a truth. There may be other things that people, these may be opinions, might be things. But if the Word theories. says it, yeah, theories. theories and all that. But we, we go back, if there's a statement in the Scripture, yeah, I believe it. Jesus walked on water, I got no problem. Uh, then we have to try to find out scientifically how that could happen. Maybe he froze it, and maybe there was Freon. Uh, none of that. We just say he walked on water. Period. So here, uh, that's where this this idea of truth is in here eight times because I think it's it's based on uh, uh, what we're supposed to do here. It says uh, the commandments, and then we say here uh, three. Three, chapter 3, uh, 18 and 19. Okay. Takes me a little bit to get to that. You know, with my computer. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. In other words, you... It isn't just saying, I, uh, uh, I love 
my you know, breth brethren, or I love God. Uh, so those are just words. Everybody, anybody can say that. But it says with deeds, and then he gives example. Uh, we we will know this that we are of the truth, and we we'll, and will assure our hearts uh, before Him. And whatever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and know all things. Beloved, if our hearts does not condemn us, we have confidence with God. So if we, our hearts means we are inward looking and saying, is there something in me that is against God? In other words, we we might have sinned. I don't care. You're a believer. You could be a, a mature believer. You can be a baby believer or something in between. We will fail. We, we, we sin. Uh, it's just part of part of our not not a human nature because human nature it doesn't in itself evil. There is no such thing. Remember, Jesus Christ was human nature, 100. percent So there's an old sin nature in us. There is a tendency to sin that Jesus Christ didn't have. That's true, but we do. So and that's why he says, you know, don't deceive yourself and says, you know, I don't have any sin. I'm perfect. I'm I'm adult. I'm, you know, no. Yeah, there is still within me that capability. So you accept it. And that's where it says, but if your heart means inside, you want to examine. He says, yeah, I messed up. So what are you supposed to do? According to 1 John 1, 1.9, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faith. So I think that's what it's talking about here. This, if, if we don't have anything to condemn us, we said, oh, I've already confessed. I, don't, I, I have confidence with the Lord. I can ask. I can pray. I can do his will. Why? Because I'm, I'm in fellowship. I think that that's that's what it says says here, right? It says <clears throat> that uh, that we're supposed to do uh, if we don't have the heart condemning us. So we have uh, also three eighteen. Let's see, eighteen and nineteen. We said uh, again, the, but in deed and in truth, you know, we combine both things. We we believe something and we carry it out. We do what we're supposed to do. And then we have um, four, six. It says, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. But this we know, the spirit of, by this, I'm sorry, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there is a, there is a sense that we're to make a decision. Uh, you know, and, and the way we know it is that when we have the truth, we can, we can make that decision of what's right and wrong. Um, and, uh, and then the word believe is in there seven times, which is the next big thing, three 323 says this is this is this is <laughs> this is his commandment that we believe in the name of the son of Jesus and oh there's the first part that's being saved you have to believe in him he says the second part is and love one another just as he commanded us so how did he command us like he did. <laughs> right. No, there's not, not, it says love, <laughs> love as I have loved you. In other words, the idea of giving himself for the church, for others. Uh, and that's, that's when we're actually practicing with the truth what God, what God is commanding us here. And he said, and he says, the one who keeps his commandments abides in them. Now, there's, there's a condition. We can't abide in them if I don't obey his commandments. Here it says, if we do this, then we abide. In it. So again, it's not, well, I obey maybe 20% or 5%. or It's saying either I'm in, I'm in fellowship or not. I'm abiding in him or not. In this case, it says, if you keep his command, abide in him. And he in him, for we, by this we know, he abides in us by the spirit whom, who's given us. So notice, now he brings in one more, one more person. <laughs> The Holy Spirit it says, "Here's a here's a a believer we, we saw in, in I guess in yeah in Ephesians 
Paul talks about that he who, uh, once you believe and you're born again, then the Holy Spirit comes in as a deposit guarantee in us. So we're saved. That's not the issue. Here the issue is whether or not we're <coughs> filled by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Remember in, uh, in that one passage uh, where Paul uses it and says, Be not be drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be ye filled by the Spirit. So it's a command. So uh, I'm going to make a big distinction. There's, there's the, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. That's one part of the work of the Spirit. He lives in us as a deposit guarantee. That never changes. We always have the Holy Spirit in us. That never changes. We become children of God. Never. But this other one, where is the command? He says, now be filled. In other words, there is something that we have to do in order to be filled by the Spirit. That's separate than this. This part happens and it stays forever. From the time I'm born again to the end. This filling of the there Spirit, is no end. <laughs> yeah, with the filling of the Spirit is is conditional. I'm in fellowship or not, walking in the light, not in the light, abiding in in righteousness or not. So, you, you, Paul, John is is one of these guys that he's got one or the other. That's and, and that's that's what he's talking about here. So this abiding, uh, he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given us. So we have the whole, same person, the Holy Spirit is there so that we can be filled by the Spirit and be controlled by the Spirit. Uh, and that way we'll be able to walk in the light. So all of these uh, <clears throat> things we, we see, and then we say, no, notice what it says. This is in verse 23. This is the commandment that we believe in the name. In other words, we, there is this idea, I can believe once to be saved. That's all it takes. It doesn't take a bunch of times. I don't have to be saved every other day. So it's not talking about this belief in the sense of how to get saved. This is believing in all the, Jesus Christ and his commandments, much like the people that were taken out of Egypt. How did that happen? God told them, put this blood on, on the doorpost and I'll take you out. If you don't do it, you die. Right? You die right there. The Holy Spirit, I mean, you know, the avenging angel will come in and, and destroy your firstborn. Okay, so he, people that believed, they went ahead and put that blood on there and they got out. They got through, through the whole ten uh, uh, plagues and everything. They came through the desert. God provides for them water, gives them food for a year. And then they finally get to the promised land. They're waiting on the other side of the promised land. They send in the 12 spies. <laughs> and, then, and then the 12 spies comes back. Say, yeah, the land is the way God said. You know, it's all of this. But it eats us up. You got giants in there. They're going to step on us. We don't, we're going to, we're going to die. He, and Moses he brought us out here to die. And then here, what happened to them? God got so angry at them. He says, because you didn't believe, you didn't mix the promises of God with faith, you're going to die in the desert on this side. And they did. And they did. Mm -hmm. Forty days it took to, to look at the land. Forty years you're going to be here in the desert until the last one of you, you know, they're probably the young people were saying, man, when's that guy going to die, man, so we can go into the promise. Forty <laughs> years it took. And then they were able to go into the promised land. The, the children are the ones that went in. It says everybody was 20 years and older. They died in the desert except for Caleb and Joshua. The only two of the two spies that came out and said, no, God said it. We can go in. But the people didn't. They, and that's, I think that's what we're talking about here. This believing has to do with more than just the belief for salvation. This has to do with belief with everything God promises, all of his commandments. I'm obeying his commandments so that I have this confidence as I walk through this land and uh, uh, and that's where he says driving out fear. I'm in love. I'm work, walking in the love of God. And, and we'll see. Uh, John talks about it in other passages about uh, in I guess in John 4, 17, where it says that um, this is how they will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. You know that's that it, it wasn't to find out whether or not they're saved. It was whether or not they were true 
followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then we have this light and darkness uh, um, episodes uh, here. And man, seems like I'm going through a lot here, but I, I want you to get uh, five. Uh, Five, five. It says, "Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes in the Son of God." Let's see. Oh, that's uh, for John five. Well, did I put that in there right? No, it's one five, not five John one. one. Yeah, John one. Okay, somebody read uh, John one five. five. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness. So. God is light. Now, does that mean that, you know, I'm looking at light. God, I'm looking at God right now. There's light right there. No, it, it's talking about his essence. God is, and, and he makes that, that comparison of darkness and light. God is light in the sense, not, not that he just shines like light. He is the source, okay, of, of the light. He is, in his essence, he's bright. He's, there is no darkness in him, it goes on to say means there is no sin, no nothing outside. So if you want to be in relationship with this God, then you have to be in fellowship. You have to go out of the darkness and into the light. You have to abide there. And that's where uh, we see here. The Gospel of John is explained the light. And all okay, there you go. Go ahead. Well, there's, there's about five different verses. But yeah, I, I'm the light. John Christ. 12, 35 and 36 says, Then Jesus said to them, Yet a little while is light with you. Yeah. Walk while you have light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness knows not where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of the light. So he, he uses the yeah, that same picture. I mean, John hasn't changed. He, he's using the same idea in this, in this letter. Uh, uh, and then we have 2, 8, and 10. First uh, John 2, 8. <laughs> On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment. Now, now before he talked about love, that's, that's in that commandment. He says, I'm writing you in, a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So it's, it says, the one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother uh, is in darkness until now. Okay? So the one who loves his brother abides in the light. You're in fellowship when you're doing this. You're out of fellowship if you hate him, right? And there is no cause for stumbling in him. So when a person is in, in fellowship, there is no, there's no sin in him. There's no reason to, to worry about uh, punishment. And, and we said that, that love is, is perfect in that sense. So, uh, and then we have darkness, as I said, it's always in, co in contrast. Uh, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness. Uh, and then we have... But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and the, walks in darkness, and he does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So if you remain out of fellowship, you're not, you, you're just going to continue to sin. You're going to be out of fellowship. God's not guiding you. You're, you're falling uh, and bumping your head against the wall kind of thing. That's, that's the idea. When you're in fellowship, you're walking in light. If you're, if you're out of fellowship, then... You'll just continue to sin and be out of fellowship. And, and then you can have fear. Because <laughs> then God could punish you while you're out here. And uh, we, we see several examples in the, old, in the New Testament where God is disciplining people for being out of fellowship. And we see that in, in the Old Testament also. But uh, <clears throat> so I think, uh, I, I think that's enough for now. So you can get the idea. This is what it's talking about. Love, light, darkness, truth and then lie and fellowship. Let's go to fellowship. Uh, and uh, it's used uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. We see that the fellowship we're talking about is this, this, this idea of being in fellowship with God, not, not with each other in the sense of just, hey, let's go have a party, and, you know, all of us believers. I think this, 
speaks of. It's talking about in verse 3. He says, What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. In other words, we are, we're having fellowship too. Okay? Hmm. But notice it says, And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the, His Son, Christ. So when he talks about we have fellowship, it's talking about our fellowship with God. Each one of us have fellowship with God. So that that's when we really have true fellowship uh, and if God isn't there. So now, and it says, these things we write to you so that may, uh, so that uh, our joy may be made complete. Now joy, a lot of times we say, well, now we're happy. You know? It's talking about a contentment that we have with the Lord. Uh, that's what it's looking for. So, <clears throat> and then uh, verse 6 and 7, it says, if we say we have fellowship, and again, we're talking about Fellowship, fellowship with what? With God. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Well, notice it says verse 7, and we saw that again. So it says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. So there's a difference. Darkness, we don't have fellowship. <clears throat> light, we have fellowship. And notice the condition the condition is right here, it says, and we have fellowship, and we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. Now, it's cleansing uh, future, past, no. or present. Present, yeah. present. Present tense. So it's talking about something that continues on. Just like, how I many of you guys still wash your hands? He says, do you wash your hands? Yeah, we, we mean we wash our hands, but on a regular basis. <laughs> you, know, you don't wash your hands once and then, okay, I'm done. It's, it's a cleansing that goes on on a regular basis. That's, mm -hmm. that's the present tense. That's what is going on here. Uh, and that's where we, we have to say uh, that's how we, 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 we regain, regain walking in the light, regain getting out of darkness. Okay. Now here's the next question we're going to go to is why. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so first of all, we say, what's the occasion? Why? Why did uh, uh, John write this letter? We can look at that. Uh, okay. Whoops. Why did that happen? Didn't go too far. Yes. He says. So we're looking at reasons or or purpose. Uh, in this case, we read here several times in First uh, uh, First John two eighteen. He says, "It is the last hour, and just as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, the Antichrist have appeared. From this, we know that we have the last hour." So we read that, but that's part of his his purpose of writing is to let them know, you know, we're we're in the last times. We're and when I say last hour, it's not. Uh, you're not saying, well, the end, you know, the end of the world is coming right here now. It says that this is the epic. This is the time of the last hour. And, and he talks about this idea mm -hmm. of uh, you heard that the Antichrist is coming. So he says that's the one Antichrist is going to be during the tribulation. That's that Antichrist. We know it. That's what he said. You know that. But now, in this time, there's a lot of Antichrists that are appeared. And then we talked about what these Antichrists were saying. They were right. saying Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. And I answer that question, why, is in 1 John chapter 1, yep. in verse 3. Okay. We declare unto you what we have seen and heard, that you also may have fellowship with us. Okay, so there you go. The, one, the purpose of that is to how am I going to have fellowship with God? If, Paul, if John doesn't tell us that, then, then he's, he wrote a letter that says I'm going to do this, but he didn't. So evidently, there's something in this letter that tells us how to get this fellowship with God. Right. Okay? And I think, and that's where I was going with this, uh, the purpose has, is one of the purposes so that we could have fellowship. And I think that's where 1 John, 1 John 1 9 is telling us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. That's, that relates it to our verse 7, right? And cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So it says, if I do this, this is how I'm going to get fellowship again. I'm, that's how I get back in the light. 
get out of darkness and put me back in the light. So I think that that purpose is there. And then we have other places. Uh, verse 22 says, uh, and then he says, and here's the Antichrist, uh, the idea that this is one of the reasons he wrote. He says, who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So if you deny Jesus Christ, and this could happen by a believer. I, I don't, you know, because people say, well, the Antichrist, they're all unbelievers. No, well, there's people out there that have been saved, but yet say these things. That Jesus didn't come in the flesh. I'm saying that doesn't automatically make you unsaved. You either saved by faith and faith alone in Christ alone, and then later on some people get lost, and that's what he's talking about. Walking in darkness, you don't know where you're going. You're going to fall. Or not. That's what happens to a believer who stays out of fellowship. It, they're they're going to get confused. But it's possible that they're not. They weren't saved in the first place. It's not, that's a, that's a possibility. Jesus but not, said that whoever the Father gives me, I will in that wise cast out. Right. He Say, said, "What you who you give to me, then I will keep." Right, and and that's that. Another passage says, "If if uh, we are faithless, he remains faithful, because he cannot deny us." So, our faithlessness doesn't make us unsaved. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? And that's where this this issue comes in in this letter it's basically either he's talking to believers and he's saying some people are this way they're walking in darkness their truth is not there they hate their brother but that doesn't mean they're not saved you follow what i'm saying i was saying yeah. that i don't okay no i, I may not agree that. but okay and and here and that's where paul i mean john is going through this this whole whoops let's see where am i why okay so he says uh the other, the other thing he says, uh, the infiltrations of Antichrist. That's one of the reasons Paul, John is writing this. There's, pe there's people in the church that are saying these things. Okay, so there, though, though that's what it, uh, John is warning them against. The other thing is to encourage so that the joy may be full. In verse one four, it says, uh, uh, let's see, where's one four? These things are right and the right way unto you that your joy may be full. Okay, so uh, so there's another reason he's writing this, so that your joy, your contentment, uh, might be complete. Full means you're actually living the Christian life to ex its full extent. Uh, so that's another reason. And then uh, chapter 2, verse 1, there's another reason why he wrote this letter. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Okay, so here uh, a reason he's writing. He's writing to little children and telling them, hey, uh, uh, so that, that you may not sin. He's telling them, there's a warning. I'm telling them, don't sin. So, uh, but if you do, in other words, and he isn't saying, oh, if you're if you're unsaved, then you go ahead and sin. He says, you children, he's talking to believers, you may sin. And that's why he says, we still have an advocate with the Father. He's always there. He's 24-7. Yes. And that's where that's where he says here, uh, and notice in verse 2, it goes on to say, and he himself, in other words, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sin. Propitiation has to do satisfying, satisfying God's will wrath against sin in the world so he's he's satisfying that so he said that's why God in the Lord's in first John 1 9 says if we confess our sins he's faithful he said he'll do it every time and just that's the important part of that 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 thing. just means because Jesus paid for it that's why he can God can forgive us if it wasn't that Jesus Christ died on the cross his forgiveness would be like uh, an old grandfather that said, oh yeah, my grandchildren are doing bad, but okay, I'll let them go with it. That's okay. They can, no, God says, no, I, I exacted all the full payment for those sins in my son. Therefore, he, he's just to forgive us our sins. He's not, uh, and then uh, in Romans, it makes the point, says uh, that God 
did this propitiation publicly so that he would be just. Justified. The one who justifies. Uh oh, too scary. I didn't know what that was. That's my fault. I just got that one up here someplace. Oh, oh, I'm already told him, sir. Okay. So, uh, yeah, as usual, time flies for me. I uh, don't get to do everything. But it's okay. It's okay. We, uh, no, we covered good. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that, you know, we're we're going through this passage, this book, and that's what this these exercises here is to try to get that context for those two verses. you got to get the whole book. You can't just... <laughs> Take just that one little section and say, okay, I understand. Let's take the whole, whole book. So, well, uh, I think we'll have to stop there. Let me see. Let me just finish this one, the, the why. And then uh, what was the purpose? And then what do you expect to happen? We see to encourage that their joy may be full and may not sin. And that they may know uh, they have eternal life. That's verse 5, uh, 3, uh, chapter Chapter 5, verse 13. That's the other third result that John is expecting when somebody reads all of this, that they will know. Uh, somebody read that for me. Chapter 5, verse uh, 5, 13. I mean, These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Okay, so here I, I understand that, you know, believers can believe one time. Yeah, and then after a year later, two years later, doubt whether or not they have salvation. I know I did that myself. I thought to myself, I'm, uh, uh, after about a year going to church and everything, my brother, Jehovah's Witness, came to me and he says, you know, Jesus is not God. I said, what do you mean he's not God? You know, and, he said, and I couldn't defend that uh, and I can remember he he tells me it says right here it says he's the firstborn of all creation and he showed me a verse and I said you know that's, that's a little difficult to, but so maybe maybe Jehovah Witnesses is right or maybe the Catholics are right that's where I left from and maybe maybe he's Quakers or maybe uh, I said well Lord help me <laughs> you know and that's and that's kind of got me into this idea let me search the scripture all of them tell me that it comes in the bible let's see where is it at in the bible show me show me and that, that, that got me going in this direction so that's what we have to understand our uh i think here john is saying i want you to be able to say i am saved okay? i had a theology professor that told me he wasn't sure until he dies and then that way because if he did remain faithful then maybe he was never saved in the first place. That's the Calvinist uh, uh, view of, of, of salvation. They're saying, yeah, we believe you're saved once and once for all, but not everybody that, that thinks they're saved will be saved, and you won't really know unless you remain faithful to the end. And then at the end, you'll know. I said, and then when he told me that, I said, he's a doctor. And I'm saying, how could he? I said, and I, you know, in my mind, it was just, it, it surprised me, but not not when I understand the the, the belief system of Calvinism and everything. I, I comprehended how they can get to that point, but for me, I'm saying, you know, I I'm positive, I'm saved. Right? I, I, that's confidence, but based on looking at the word. They skip over the verse that says, "I've written these things that you may know." Right? And that's what it says here, right? <laughs> yeah. This is why he wrote this. I said, if you read this letter and you understand, and comprehend, then you can know. You can't so, just take one or a few verses out of nope. context. you got to let Scripture explain Scripture. Exactly. And then you take the easier, the ones that are more plain Scripture to interpret the more difficult, the ones that are, may have multiple meanings. And here, just to finish the why, it was avoid deception and do not deny sin exists, confess your sin in order to have fellowship, and live like children of light, love one another. So those are, if I were to write down, here's the per why this letter is written, those would be like in a nutshell, all of what this, this passage. So far, this is about as far as we've gotten this time. Next week, we'll just go on to, to the next question, which is when. 
But uh, What's so the next question? it's when. It when? says, yeah, when was it written, date written, That's what available. time period. That's available. And then, and that, yeah, and again, yeah, those are, the, those, anyway. right, and, and, and that's why we leave it kind of open. You know, we, is it, the when is more of what dispensation was it written? It's the more important question. Uh, is it written in the time of Moses and the commandments, or is it written after or before? So that's kind of, so let's take a few moments and we'll pray. Uh, Father, we give you thanks for this time that you've given us. We pray that you might make clear to us your word, Father, and that uh, we may be able to arrive at the truths and, and be able to have that confidence that your word gives us of our salvation and that we are in fellowship with you. We ask for your help in these areas in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay.